Follow along with me as I read from Hebrews 13, again, verses 17 through 19. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls, as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably, honorably in all things. I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. Obey, submit. Well, what do you think about when you hear those words? Now, granted, it's the context, right, oftentimes, that it has to do with how we respond to these types of words, to obey and to submit. But I think all of us, to a degree, maybe are a little uncomfortable, maybe even stronger feelings than discomfort, stronger feelings, stronger thoughts when it comes to these two words. And the fact is, I think because of our fallenness, because we are sinners, this is the reality. We have an aversion to someone having a say over our lives. Now, it's more acceptable in other cultures to, to understand authority and the role of authority more so than in the West, especially here in the U.S., where individualism has been has, has, has risen to an art form or has come into full bloom, if you will. But the fact is, I, I think it's actually come into full decay in many ways when it comes to understanding our role and authority and how we are to be obedient and what that means in our lives. Because the fact is, most people, I shouldn't say, yeah, in our culture today, I would venture to say most people, have this attitude, even if they don't say it, there is something within them. You can't tell me what to do. I don't want any shackles. I don't want any restrictions. Institutionalism or authoritarianism, nothing like that. Traditionalism, I don't want you to tell me what to do. That's just part of the tradition, and I refuse to be under that. This type of thinking about obedience and submission is the breeding ground, many of them would say, for abuse and pride, right? And so we shouldn't use those types of terms. We shouldn't think in those terms. Now, certainly not everyone thinks like this, understand that. But I do think that there's something in all of us, even just a little bit, that rebels. Rebels against parents, maybe? rebels against an employer, rebels against a homeowner's association. How dare they they can't, how dare they they tell me I can't do that. This is my property. Well, you bought the property that had a homeowner's association, right? Or maybe even a professor that tells you you need to do something this way or that way. The reality is God mediates his earthly rule this is god's economy right he mediates his earthly rule both secular and sacred or through a hierarchy of authority that's the way god functions that's the way god rules and even pagan rulers even though they don't claim god even though they don't they don't they have no use for god they are still used by him for his purposes in the world today. This is the way God mediates his rule is through human beings. Romans 13, 1 tells us this, right? Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God and those that exist that have been instituted by God. Now we know this verse and we, we understand that God sets up rulers, earthly rulers, right? But we also have to, have to understand that there are limits to their authority, right? There's a limit to what they can tell us to do and not do. If authority, whether it is the government or whether it's an individual that has authority over us, if they tell us to do something that is outside of God's word, contrary to God's word, we don't have to submit to that. I hope you understand that. Romans 13, 1 does not say that we, that we as Christians could just be rolled over and we're just going to do whatever the government says because they are our authority over us. I hope we understand that, no, 
the higher authority is God's word. And any time an authority over us, whether it's the U.S. government or whatever it may be, stands against this, we have no obligation to submit to that authority, period. Now, that's a sermon for another day, and maybe I do need to preach a sermon now. But there are limits to the authority that God has granted to them and limits to the degree that we must obey. However, a hierarchy of authority is God's designed way of mediating his rule. That's the truth. Hierarchy of authority is, is God's designed way of mediating his rule. And that's why, as an aside, very quickly, it's important for Christians to be a part of different, you know, uh, um, whether it's a city council or county council or it's a school board or, or it's a state government or a, a U.S. government, federal government, and so forth. I think, it's impo- I think it's important that believers be a part of that. Either run and, and actually take office and be in office and, and rule in a godly way or support godly men and women who will do that, who understand this is God's word, who desire to honor Christ in the way that they govern. Or at the very least, we need to be informed about the people that we are electing into office. I think that's important. I think we have a role to play when it comes to this because we understand as believers that this is the way that God has designed, that he mediates his rule in the world today. So we have an integral part to play in that as we understand that more fully. But for us, when I say for us, I mean for us believers, God's most important rule is through spirit-controlled men. Someday God will rule all the earth through his Son, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But in the meanwhile, God's design set forth in Scripture is to rule his church through godly leaders. So we're going to look at five points today. Who are these godly leaders? What is their role? Should we submit in all things? All of those types of things. And so the first one is, who are these leaders? The second one is, what and who, or what and slash who do we obey and submit to? Third, what is the purpose of spiritual leadership? Fourth, how do elders and pastors lead? And then fifth, the church's vital role in all of this. So who are these leaders that he talks about here and in, in chapter 13? The ones that we are to obey and submit to. Well, you understand, if you've been around Cross Life for any amount of time, that we are an elder-led church. Why? Why are we an elder-led church? I believe that it is the, the, the closest, closest biblical form of leadership laid out for us in the New Testament. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not other forms that are, that are good forms, right? Others that bring the congregation more in, in and that type of thing. But when it comes to Scripture, I think, there is, I think we have to look at what is laid out for us. What do we see happening over and over in the New Testament when it comes to leadership and who God has ordained that, that, that those that should lead his church? And there's nothing in the New Testament to suggest that any church was led or governed by anyone other than those designated as elders. Now, again, we see times where, uh, where a role for the congregation has to come in and so forth. But as far as ultimate authority within a congregation is the elders. And we see this pattern affirmed by the description of Paul's ministry in Acts 14, 23, when he says, And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church. So this is what we see happening. When leadership is appointed over a church or churches, it's always in the form of elders. That's what we see throughout the New Testament. And we also know from Titus, 1 Timothy 3, and other places that these elders are to be men. So let's admit something now, can we? For one thing, let's admit that me talking about men so much may make some of you guys a little uncomfortable. That's just the reality of what God's word says. But let's admit something else now. The church has been hurt. The church has been hurt an untold number of times and an untold number of ways by men who were ungodly leaders. That's the reality who had no concept of what it means to shepherd the people of God, to lovingly watch over their souls. 
And there's probably a lot of people in here like that that have been through situations before where unfortunately you did not sit under godly men, godly shepherds who cared well for your souls. And I'm sorry. I hope, by God's grace, that never happens here at Cross Life. But I also understand that's a reality in the church today, and it has been a reality from the very beginning. Stephen Parr brought it up in the last Sunday school. From the very beginning, elders, leaders in the church went rogue. Soon after Paul left the church in Ephesus, what did he tell them? He told the elders there, listen, you're going to have some elders among you that are going to rise up like wolves, right? Shortly after Paul left, he knew that was going to be the case. And that's been the case for the last 2,000 years. And so if you have scars, if you have wounds from being in a church where you were damaged, where you were hurt by ungodly and uncaring men, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It is our commitment and our prayer that that never happens to you here. That's why we take eldership so seriously here. We will not ask anyone to consider being an elder here at Cross Life too quickly. There's too much at stake. God's people are too precious to him to take spiritual leadership lightly, and we will never do that. We take the qualifications put forth for us in Titus and 1 Timothy 3 seriously. So we don't want to move too quickly when it comes to appointing elders. We don't want to move too slowly either, right? So there's a balance there. Because it's important now for who leads our church, who's the spiritual leaders, who's shepherding the people of God, but it's also important for the future as well. As cross life grows and as we appoint new elders and as people come and go and as people get older and die and all of those types of things and we have a couple of generations later, we want those generations to look back on godly leaders and remember them well. Remember them as faithful men who loved the church, who loved the body of Christ. And that's what, that's what the author of Hebrews tells them to do in 13.7. Remember that? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life. And then do what? Imitate their faith. These are the types of spiritual leaders that we're talking about here. Men who you can look at their faith and imitate their faithfulness in the way that they lived for God. So the leaders he refers to. So the ones that, that had been put in place earlier. They now have, been, have, have moved on. They've died. We don't know exactly what happened to the elders, but we know that was a few years ago, so many of them have probably died. But now new elders have come along, and new elders have been put into their place. place. And they were to follow in the tradition of the first leaders who faithfully taught the word and lived lives of faithfulness. So then that brings us to this question, right? What or slash who do we obey and submit to? That's the big question here. And simply put, it is the elders that we are to obey and submit to. But then the question is, what does this look like, right? Does it look like what I said on, on Friday when I send out the Cross Life Connect, that it is now mandatory that, you know, the elders met, Steve and Charles and I, we met, and we just decided, you know what, we just, this needs to be mandatory. Everyone needs to wear a suit. All the men need to wear suits and ties, and women, you need to wear dresses. And that is, that is, the, that is the decree sent down by the elders today. <laughs> I think that's the only amen. <laughs> Actually, maybe two. Does it mean that everyone, a decree has come down, is required to give 10%? Does it mean that, you know what, we as an elder board have just decided that it, it is time for us to get serious about our health? If we're really going to follow God, if we're going to, you know, wake up every day feeling good and have energy so that we can serve him, everyone, every single individual and family, we're going to go on the whole 30 for the next year, the whole 30 diet, all right? It, it's mandatory. We laugh, right? We laugh at these types of things because they're, they're absurd. But the fact is, there are pastors 
who desire to exert this kind of authority over their local body, over their local church, who a person should marry or what job a, a person should take or where they should live. Now, should a pastor have input into these things? Should you seek out guidance from a spiritual leader on things like marriage and, and a job and possibly where to live? Uh, maybe. That may be a very wise thing to do. But an elder never has the authority to, to say, you should marry this person, you will marry this person, or whatever it may be. I, I hope we know, all of us know, that these are not the types of things we should be obeying and submitting to. The author of Hebrews is calling his readers to listen to and receive the teachings of those who are commissioned to teach. So, submit to what is taught as it is in an accordance or an agreement with God's word. Does that make sense? We submit... We obey our leaders, our spiritual leaders, elders here at Cross Life. With everything that is taught, as long as it is in accordance with or in agreement with, with God's word. As long as that is happening, believers should take the teaching seriously and the, indeed obey and submit to it. Does that make sense? So it's not whatever is said from this pulpit or whatever is said by an elder or spiritual leader here that you should obey and submit to. No, it really is what is being taught as long as it is in accordance with God's word. That's what you obey and submit to. Therefore, you're not obeying the person, the man, you're obeying God. The person, when I rightly preach the word of God, and I'm asking you to obey that and submit to that. I'm not asking you to obey and submit to me. I'm asking you to obey and submit to God himself. Because in this particular context here at Cross Life, he has called me to be one of the elders here, to be the teaching pastor, if you will, here. Now, if I go off the rails and I start teaching things that are untrue, that are unbiblical, you have no obligation to submit or obey to those things I teach at all. But as long as it's in accordance with, as long as it rightly lines up with this, none of us have an option as to whether to submit or obey. Now we do, right? We can, we can say, no, I'm not, I'm not going to obey that. You're not saying no to me if I preach something and you're saying, I'm just not going to obey that. If I have rightly preached the word of God and the word of God puts out a command or a way that we should live our lives and it's clear, there's no doubting, doubting it. If you say, no, I'm not going to obey that, again, you're not rebelling against me or whoever that teacher may be. You're rebelling against God himself if his word is properly taught. If what I'm saying matches this so i hope you understand that i hope you understand what he is saying when he says to obey and submit to your leaders it's not whatever whim we may have for any particular week it's the word of god rightly proclaimed and rightly taught all right so then third what is the purpose of spiritual leadership his primary concern in teaching this and our primary concern in understanding this is to lead individual souls into maturity in Christ. That should be our primary concern as spiritual leaders, right? When we uh, were in Colorado and I was an elder there uh, on the elder board, our verse for leading our people well was Colossians 1.28. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom. Why? And to what end? That we may present everyone mature in Christ. That was our heart's desire as elders of Front Range Alliance Church. That we may present everyone mature in Christ. That's our desire here. Myself, Steve Forrester, Charles Dumerisk. It is our desire that everyone here at Cross Life will one day be presented mature in Christ, that you are growing in godliness, that you are growing in your understanding of who you are as a son and as a daughter of the living God. 
as you grow in your understanding of what it means to submit to the word of God, to obey the word of God, as that starts to take hold in your life and you start to see fruit in your life from obeying his word and others see the fruit of a life lived faithfully. We desire to present that, that everyone here would be able to be presented mature in Christ. Because the fact is, spiritual leaders, and it is a scary statement, will have to give an account. That's what his word says. Spiritual leaders will have to give an account for the way in which we keep watch over your souls. More literally, it says, on behalf of your souls. The verb translated keep watch literally means to pass sleepless nights or to keep oneself awake. I've had a few of those. I think that's one reason that membership is so important to the local body. You've, we've talked about membership for a long time now. We've been talking about it for accreditation. When we had a meeting a, a year ago, we laid out reasons for membership. The fact is, God's word never says, lays out that, that we should be members of a local body, right? It never lays it out that clearly for us. But there are good reasons why membership is, 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 is appropriate. And I think this is one of those reasons. That when you become a member of a local body, it really allows the elders, the spiritual leaders of that body to know, all right, the, these are my people. These, these are the sheep that God has called me to shepherd. And it makes it very clear for us, right? Now, that does not mean that if you're an attender here and you decide not to become a member, that you're on your own, right? I'm sorry. You're not our responsibility. No, you are our responsibility. And we take that responsibility very seriously. But this is just one, one more way for us to understand who, who's, who's in the fold here, who's part of the body of Christ, or the local body here at Cross Life. Not the body of Christ. If you're a believer, we're in the body of Christ, okay? Everyone understand that. But a local church here. Spiritual leaders in local church are watchmen. And we must remain constantly alert to any threat that might come your way. Paul issued this exhortation and warning to the elders of the church at Ephesus. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. That's, that is a statement that President George Bush would have said has gravitas. This is a heavy statement in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. But then he says this, and again, Stephen Parr talked about it a little bit earlier this morning. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. The fact is, elders can indeed go off the rails, Right? We, and, he, and he brought this up this morning. And he, he made a great point. So often we see a church and it's going great, right? You know, the, the good things are happening and, and church is growing. People are coming to know Jesus and people are growing in godliness, all of those types of things. And then a year or two later, you hear that things have just, you know, there's a split and half the people have left and all of these different things. And you think, what happened? And oftentimes you look and it, it, the root can be the leadership. The leadership has, has bought into the worldliness, has started to do things in their own strength and by their own wisdom instead of relying upon God and his word. There's a lot of reasons that can happen. You know, personal gain, right? Someone, someone starts to see that they have a, a pastor, an elder starts to see they have a lot of influence, and so they use that influence for negative gain or for, for, for yeah, for shameful gain. And they start to use people and manipulate people for their own purposes and good. And the next thing you know, a church that was doing so well has now gone down. Why? Because the person has become, the spiritual leader has become someone similar to who Paul describes here. That the church, that the spiritual leaders need to be on the lookout for. Elders can go off the rails. That is why it's so important that we take the qualifications for being an elder so seriously that is why spiritual leaders must pay close attention to the word of god to make sure that their own teaching teaching 
is in line with the truth and that others who teach are being faithful to the word. I expect if I say something wrong from the pulpit that at the very least Charles or Steve will will come up to me afterward and say, do you realize you said this? If it's something that needs to be corrected, that, that I will correct it. Thank you. And I want to put that invitation out to you as well. We're to be Bereans, right? Knowing the word of God. And just because someone says it up here doesn't mean, okay, stamp it, that's approved, that's, that's, that's the gospel truth. I hope it is. And as long as it's in accordance with God's word, it, it will be. But I'm not infallible. Sometimes I'll talk about Job being in the belly of the well instead of Jonah. You know, those types of things. I'll tell you, there's, there's hardly ever a sermon that goes by that I'm not at home a little bit later, you know, eating our, our lunch, thinking, oh, why did I say that? Uh, why did I say that? Why didn't I say this? Anyway, I digress. The bottom line is this. Elders and pastors are appointed to help you experience spiritual benefits and blessings so that you will be progress so that you will progressively look more and more like Jesus. That's the bottom line. That's the desire of spiritual leaders, of, of faithful men who take our role seriously to help all the people that are under our charge to progressively look more and more like Jesus. Not to look progressively more and more like Pastor Todd and how he thinks and what he says and all of those types of things. No, like Jesus. So we're diligently working, or we desire to, diligently keep working to keep Christ central and supreme in the affections of all the people. That's our desire. It's for this that spiritual leaders will be held accountable. And we're not held accountable for your salvation. That's the work of God, right? But as much as it is within our power, your spiritual well-being, we will be held accountable for. Jesus followed up the parable of the foolish manager by saying, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Now when, for those of us that, that have children, and, you know, we went off maybe for that first date after having that child or, that, or those children. And we went off, and so we, you know, we found the, found the babysitter, right? We found the babysitter that we really entrusted, that we, that we knew a lot about. We knew that they had had their proper training, right? All of those types of things. They came with great references. And so we leave, maybe still with a little trepidation. But we leave with the trust that the one that we have left in their charge, they will care for. Because this person, this child, is precious to their mother and I. And so we leave entrusting this person with our child. Brothers and sisters, how precious do you think you are to the living God? Sons and daughters of the living God, how precious are you to him? He takes spiritual leadership seriously. He has entrusted spiritual leaders, the elders of the church, with his children to care for, to nurture, to feed, to protect. And we take this seriously. Much has been entrusted to the elders of the church of God as precious children. We do not take that lightly. Number four, how do elders and pastors lead? The verse says, let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Now, some look at this verse and they say, well, that's talking about the people in the church, those, the, uh, the, 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 the ones that are being shepherded. They should be shepherded with joy and they should, do, they should take correction and being shepherded without complaining and without groaning and all of those types of things. And while that's a possibility, I don't think that's what he's saying here. I indeed he's, think he's still talking to the elders. That he's saying, elders, spiritual leaders, shepherd the people with joy. Don't do it with grumbling and complaining. 
understand what a great privilege I have given to you to shepherd my children. I mean, going back to the babysitter thing, right? If we, if we are, are leaving this babysitter with our precious one, and they come in, and I'm like, oh, I don't want to do it. All right. You pay good money, so I guess I'll do it. All right. Is that going to instill confidence in us? Do we want to leave our precious one with such a babysitter? What kind of care are they going to receive? No, we'll probably just say, you know what, thanks for coming, but see ya. We're just going to stay at home tonight. No, oh, God wants his elders, God wants his, his chosen leaders to shepherd the people with joy and to do it with no sense of complaining or anything like that. He doesn't want spiritual curmudgeons. And the picture I just ha kept having was of Bernie Sanders. I don't, and I'm not getting into politics here, but let's just be honest. He is a curmudgeon, right? And I could just see a bunch of Bernie Sanders going around, you know, say, oh, the church would be great if it weren't for all these people, right? That's not the kind of attitude God calls for his spiritual leaders, his shepherds of the flock to have, not at all. He wants us to serve out of a satisfaction and delight in Christ joyfully, without complaining. Because if we do otherwise, there will not be any kind of spiritual benefit in being led, led by men who don't delight in giving themselves to your care, nourishment, and protection. The reality is there is always a tension, right? There's always a tension between serving with joy and enduring the hardships that come with serving. And the pain of, of watching people you care for suffer. Suffer from their own disobedience or suffer from a consequence of the fallenness of this world that we live in. Philip Brooks, he was a, a one-time Episcopal bishop of Boston. He said this. He said, to be a true minister to men and women is always to accept new happiness and new distress. The man who gives himself to other men can never be a wholly sad man, but no more can he be a man of unclouded gladness. To him shall come with every deeper consecration a before untasted joy, but in the same cup shall be mixed a sorrow that it was beyond his power to feel before. When I read this quote, I thought, yeah, Phillips Brooks got it. Because, brothers and sisters, there is no other joy like the joy of shepherding people and seeing them come more fully into the understa an understanding of the gospel and what it means to truly live for Jesus, to understand that their sins have truly been forgiven, that they are a son or daughter of the living God, that they are loved with a love that is beyond their comprehension. To see people come to know that for the first time and come to know Christ, or for people maybe who have been believers for a long time and come into a greater understanding of that, honestly, there is no greater joy. But there's also no greater heartbreak than to, to see a brother or sister struggling. They know the truth, but they're not living it out. They know the truth, but they refuse to obey. They know the truth, but shackles are still around them, just like they were unbelievers. And that's hard. It's hard to see brothers and sisters that I care for and love going through difficult times. Difficult times that were not brought on by any sins of the, uh, or bad decisions or sins of their own, but because, again, of the fallenness of this world that we live in, and because of that, going through incredibly difficult situations. That's hard as well. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 3, I think, gets to the heart of what it means to be a faithful shepherd of the flock. Peter says, So I exhort the elders among you, shepherd the flock of God, that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, he says, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. I love what Peter says here, certainly not under compulsion. 
The reason one becomes an elder is not because they were pressured into doing so. Man, you, you see all the work I have to do here. You see the people, right? I need you. I need you to serve as an elder. I know life is crazy for you right now. I know all these things, but, but come on, I need you. That's under compulsion. And there's a lot of ways that that can look, and I just gave you one brief example, but there's a lot of ways that people can feel compelled to serve as an elder, right? Well, they've been at a church for, for forever, right? People are going to think certain things about me if I don't become an elder, and so I get, well, okay, I guess I'll be an elder. When in reality, they shouldn't be an elder. They might make a great deacon, but they're not an elder. But they feel compelled because of what people may think of them to become an elder. And again, there's a lot of different reasons, but they should never be, uh, be compelled. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't ask, right? We should ask people. This is what I've seen in you. This is what I've observed in you. And I would like for you to consider being an elder here at Cross Life. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's when I start giving the, the, the hard sell, right? Start twisting some arms and that type of thing. That's when it's wrong. The scripture tells us, 1 Timothy 3, 1 says that elders must want to be elders. That doesn't mean that you're up all night just saying, oh, I want to be an elder. I dream of being an elder one day. No, it doesn't mean that. But it does mean, maybe when asked, that you prayerfully go before the Lord and say, Lord, are you calling me to be this? And then in your heart, if you can say, you know what, I do care deeply for, about God's people. I do desire to see them become more like Christ. I do desire to see them grow in their maturity so that on that day they could be presented mature in Christ. Yeah, I have that kind of desire. Well, that's a beautiful thing. Nor for shameful gain, Peter tells us. I read an article, this was a few years ago now, but it just blew my mind. But it was about atheist priests. It was about those that no longer believed in, in what they said they once believed about Christ and God and the church and all of these types of things. They didn't believe it anymore. And they considered themselves atheist or at the very least agnostic priests. Now they didn't tell anyone, right? But they continue to be priests. Why? Because it was just a good gig. I mean, they, they got well paid, they got all these benefits, people respected them, all of these types of things. And the way they looked at it in this article, the way many of them looked at it, yeah, you know what, I just get paid to play a role. I'm playing the role of a priest, and so I can do that. But they didn't believe. Broke my heart. And the fact is, I, I think there's a lot of pastors today who are like that. They're just doing it. It's not so much that they have a passion for Jesus. Maybe they've lost that passion. Maybe they have real strong doubts. But it's just a good gig. And so they continue on. Not for sham shameful gain. Spiritual leaders are not to be motivated by the possibility of re riches or a cushy lifestyle. We see examples of this. You know, just turn on the television and flip over a few channels, you'll find... I believe examples of this men who are there for shameful gain not domineering this I think this is the closest thing we have in scripture to those that spiritually abuse those in their charge now I'm going to read a list here in just a moment and it's kind of a long list but I, I, I want you to listen to it because I think Peter has in mind here the sort of individual who exploits his position of authority to lord it over others, always exerting his power, always demanding rather than serving. I think that may be who Peter has in mind. And I'm going to read a list from, as I was doing my study this past week, of one commentator who had a list of ways that spiritual leaders can domineer. And I don't want myself or any of the spiritual leaders ever at Cross Life to have any of these characteristics. If we were to read this list in five years, I never, ever want any of our spiritual leaders, our elders, to come to mind when these types of things are read. So hang in there with me as I read this. Why do I feel compelled to read it? Because the fact is, I'm not always going to be the pastor here at Cross Life. We're not always going to have the elders that we currently have at Cross Life. You know, pastors come and go. In the next 20 years, 30 years, when you guys get a new pastor... Okay, maybe not that long. But anyway, I don't plan on going anywhere. I, the church always needs to be aware, always needs to be looking. Not 
in a in a way that's just weird, right? You don't always want to be looking out for these red flags. But you also want to be cautious. And when you see start to see where spiritually you're going down one of these directions, you want to be able to stand up and go to the leadership, go to others and say, this is a problem. So again, please just bear with me. A pastor domineers whenever he threatens them with stern warnings of the discipline and judgment of God, even though there is no biblical basis for doing so. A pastor domineers whenever he threatens them with public exposure of their sin, should they not conform to his will and knuckle under to his plans. A pastor domineers whenever he uses the sheer force of his personality to overwhelm others and coerce their submission. A pastor domineers whenever he uses slick verbiage or eloquence to humiliate people into feeling ignorant or less competent than they really are. A pastor domineers whenever he presents himself as super spiritual. His views came about only as a result of extensive prayer and fasting and seeking God. How could anyone then possibly disagree with him? A pastor domineers whenever he exploits the natural tendency people have to elevate their spiritual leaders above the average Christian. A pastor domineers whenever he gains a following and support against all dissenters by guaranteeing those who stand with him that they will gain from it, either by being brought into his inner circle or by some form of promotion. A pastor domineers by widening the alleged gap between clergy and laity. In other words, he reinforces in them the false belief that he has a degree of access to God, which they don't. He domineers by building into people a greater loyalty to himself than to God, Or he makes it appear that not to support him is to work at cross purposes with God. He domineers by teaching that he has a gift that enables him to understand scripture in a way they cannot. They are led to believe they cannot trust their own interpretive conclusions and must yield at all times to his. He domineers by short-circuiting due process, by shutting down dialogue and discussion prematurely by not giving all concerned an opportunity to voice their opinion. He domineers by establishing an inviolable barrier between himself and the sheep. He either surrounds himself with staff who insulate him from contact with the people or withdraws from the daily affairs of the church in such a way that he is unavailable and unreachable. He domineers by making people feel unsafe and insecure should they desire to voice an objection to his proposals and policies to question him as to become his enemy. He domineers by convincing them ever so subtly that that their spiritual welfare is dependent on his will. People are led to believe that their faith rises or falls upon his life and decisions. To cross him is to cross God. And last one, he domineers when he uses people as a means to his own satisfaction rather than enabling them to experience satisfaction in Christ Jesus. Maybe you've sat under a spiritual leader who exhibited one or more of those characteristics. My hope and my prayer is that you will never sit under anyone with any of these characteristics here at Cross Life. Instead, Peter exhorts elders to uh, indeed shepherd the flock of God, exercising oversight willingly. This is synonymous with joy, joyfully, eagerly, and being examples being examples to the flock of God. If I can, can I cast a vision for you for the elders of Cross Life and the spiritual leaders? The elders of Cross Life want you to feel safe and free. We want you to have room to grow and develop in accordance with your own unique gifts. And at the same time, you're lovingly led and nurtured by those whom God has raised up as the spiritual leaders here at Cross Life. We want you to be protected and guarded from heresy without being forced to believe something when you believe Scripture teaches something different. We want you to feel the love the elders and pastors have for you. We want you to understand that we are both joyful and serious about what God has called us to do. We're meeting this Saturday, and I I so covet your prayers for this Saturday, the 26th, as as Charles, Steve, and myself meet to to meet together and to pray together and to talk about the future of cross life and how we can better shepherd the people of Christ. How we can better shepherd people and disciple people here at cross life. So I really cover your prayers. And we want you to be confident that we are leading you well without you feeling controlled or coerced or in any way exploited or used 
for our personal gain. And that is why we need your prayers. 13, 18, pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. We need your prayer. Pray for our spiritual lives. Pray for our families. Pray that we conduct ourselves in a, in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ Jesus. Pray that we are pursuing Christ. Pray that we will teach his word faithfully. Pray that we will live in such a way and shepherd in such a way that our consciences are clear. We cannot minister effectively if they are not. May we be able to say with Paul, as he says in 2 Corinthians 1.12, For our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God and supremely so toward you. That's our hope and that's our prayer, and we need your prayers to that end. We cannot do it in and of ourselves. We can't. We need the body of Christ. You need us, and we need you. That's the way God has set all of this up. So obey and submit. Let's come full circle here. Far from being the horrible words of subjugation and authoritarianism that our culture makes them out to be, they are glorious words. Glorious words that God intends for our good. And we will see the fruit of that as spiritual leaders of the church as we faithfully teach the word of God, shepherd the people of God with our highest desire to be to present everyone mature in Christ. Ultimately, that is what obedience and submission is, isn't it? Allowing our lives to be completely given over to the authority of the word and to the lordship of Jesus Christ, our King, our Lord. Let us all be desirous to live faithfully and to obey and submit to this. Not to man, but to this. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, help us to do this. I pray for the leaders here at Cross Life. I'm asking you to please help myself, Charles, Steve, as you have appointed us as elders here at Cross Life. Help us to shepherd our people well, to love them well, to help them to flourish, to help them to thrive in the gospel, to help them to pursue you, Lord Jesus to help them to grow in their knowledge and understanding of your word, to help them to grow in their understanding of, of how to apply that word to their lives, to help them by the power of your spirit, to have a deep and earnest desire to submit to your word and to obey your word. We need you. The leaders of the church need you. The body of Christ needs you. Help us to faithfully do what you have called us to do so that we can be the church that you have called us to be. So we can be your, your, your feet, your hands, so that we could be your mouthpiece to a lost and dying world that needs you so much. Help us as the church to be the church that you have called us to be so that we can be that, that representation to you that brings glory and honor to, uh, to you so that we can be good ambassadors for who you are and your love that you have for us and indeed the love that you have for a fallen world. Help us to do these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.